Welcome to worship this morning on this Sunday morning. God greets and welcomes members and regular attenders and first-time visitors to worship today. People here in person and people watching at home on Facebook Live. I ask you all to rise and receive God's greeting for us this morning. The Lord welcomes all of us here to his presence today, not as an unapproachable, powerful, uncaring God, but as a heavenly father that loves us and wants us to join him in his sanctuary today. Let's all worship the risen Savior together.
Speak, O oh Lord, is one of my favorite uh, Keith Getty songs, and I would like to encourage us all to sing it very carefully. The lyrics are wonderful. Um. So we go uh, at number 53. We call on all governments to do public justice and to protect the rights and freedoms of individuals, groups, and institutions so that each may do their tasks. We urge governments and pledge ourselves to safeguard children and the elderly from abuse and exploitation, to bring justice to the poor and oppressed, and to promote the freedom to speak Work, worship and associate. Followers of the Prince of Peace are called to be peacemakers, promoting harmony and order and restoring what is broken. We call on our governments to work for peace and to restore just relationships. We deplore the spread of weapons in our world and on our streets with the risks they bring and the horrors they bring. We call on all nations to reduce their arsenals to what is needed in the defense of justice and freedom. We pledge to walk in ways of peace 
confessing that our world belongs to God. He is our sure defense. You may have a seat. Um, all the kids that want to go to Sunday school may go now. Once again, uh, just to remind everybody, we'll do our offering as you leave the sanctuary today there by the doors. That's something that we'll continue doing as uh, part of social distancing. We have an opportunity to go to God. My fingers will work. Go to God with our prayers and our praise reports this morning. Um, a couple of that I have, I sent out an email in the middle of the week. A co-worker of mine, Chris, who has a brother who has COVID and is separated from his wife who has full-blown dementia. They are both doing well and she thanks you for the prayers. Um, they're not out of the woods yet, but they have taken a positive turn. So that will remember that uh, Don Bogue is home and Vicki is lonely. Uh, I'll take care of him with the feeding tube and, and working on the pancreatitis and try to figure out what to do with that. And then we'll also remember Rich and Sue Hamster. I don't know if everybody got a chance to see the email from Rich, but uh, a couple weeks ago the chemo is ended. There's not much that the chemo will do anymore, so they've started a caring page for him, and we'll just follow him. Um, Rich is a great letter writer, and he's got a great amount of faith even in just words that he wrote in an email, so it was very strengthening to read how strong he's remaining in this. Um, but we'll remember him and Sue in our prayers as well. Does anybody else have any other prayer requests? Brenda? We still do not have my dad's test results back. Okay. It's had a couple of weeks and it's going on almost four. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Carol. Time for praise. <clears throat> um, like praise God for the people that He's put in mine and Phil's lives and all the blessings we have. Thank you. Here we go, Robin. Um, Lisa Smith would like us to pray for her friend Joy, who ha is having a high-risk pregnancy. So just prayers for a healthy, safe pregnancy. Okay. Thank you. That reminds me, if you're watching on Facebook Live, if you have prayer requests, you can certainly put them in the comments, and Rhonda will try to catch them before we have prayer time and uh, bring them up and we can pray for them. Anybody else? Run. I would like prayers for a young man who has been showing himself around Calvin's campus to young ladies in inappropriate ways that that they find him and that he get whatever help is needed. Yeah, this is a, a security and emergency thing. She got a notification the other day from the campus security that they're trying to catch this person. And I just had, had another one. Other issues, even off campus, so it's kind of a, I want to stop this and protect everybody and fix whatever's going on. Okay. Right on. Just sort of reminded me, we had a mentally challenged young man that did that out in Croton twice and he got in trouble and got caught. But his family had lived in our area for, well, their family homestead was over 50 years old. And because of what happened in the way that certain people in our township told everybody who he was that had done it, the family felt the necessity to move. So we should pray for them because he, he is mentally challenged and everyone knew that. And his family just really felt the pressure and everyone kind of condemned them. Anybody else? 
Larry. Well, Brenda's having a birthday tomorrow. So I think we're going to turn that on. What? Maybe. Maybe? Maybe. Oh, it's coming. Yeah. Sorry. I think we need to sing. Who wants to sing? Who started? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Brenda. Happy birthday to you. Prayers for this church and all churches in general. We saw a new segment about how churches have been really in decline, church attendance in the last 10 years. A lot of it is due to COVID, a lot of it is due to people, you know, other illnesses are going south or west or whatever, but also just um, the people have become desensitized. It's been very convenient to do the live stream thing in the crux, you know, when we were in the center of this whole thing, but it's convenient to stay home. You know, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I entirely agree. I've had conversations about when to stop the Facebook feed, and then I have conversations with people who are like, oh, it's such a blessing to be able to have, you know? And so, yeah, I, I appreciate that prayer with them. Thank you. Anybody else? Shall we go to God in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you that you have gathered us together with your love as a family that is founded on the love of a heavenly father that we may gather together and praise you for those great things those blessings that we have experienced in our lives that we know only come from you and so we thank you that that we have a heavenly father in you that listens to us and hears our prayer requests and, and accepts our praise reports and actually just celebrates with us in those blessings that we have. You know, we praise your name with, with Phil and Carol for the people that you have placed in, in their lives and in our lives and, and those blessings that we get from those people that you placed in our lives that we know that there's people in the world that we can lean on, that, that we have, that we can love on and they can love on us back when we need to. And, and we know that there's that blessing that comes from the family of God and, and from your heavenly throne. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask for that continued blessing on New Community Church of Milango and, and all churches who are struggling post COVID pandemic and we're in this treatment and protection phase and people are still very nervous to come out of their homes and, and church attendance, not only for our church personally, but churches around the globe have found a struggle with in-person church attendance as, as the body of Christ gathers together in one location to worship you together. Churches are, are more empty these days than they ever have been and it's a combination of comfort and fear from COVID and, and just getting used to doing things in a new way, which means maybe not necessarily having to get up in the morning and how to, whatever the reason is, it, it affects the church. And we just ask that you continue to bless and strengthen the body of believers so that when it comes time to worship you, that the church may see a boom and, and a an explosion of, of church attendance and, and, a, and a revival of, of church strength, dear Heavenly Father. Do Lord protect us as we go about, not only as the church, but as individuals, as, as Christians in your family, dear Heavenly Father. And Calvin University is, is on our minds with this person driving around campus, uh, doing things inappropriately. Let's just say it's a, it's a hazard and a danger to the young women there. And 
We just ask for the protection of our students, or our kids on campus, colleges everywhere, and, and in high school and in middle school, dear Heavenly Father, that those people that are charged with taking care of them have the tools and the ability to stop that kind of evil in the world that would wish to harm our kids. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we pray for protection on the first responders and the frontline workers and the people in the medical fields and, and the service industries that have to work and, and go out each day, not only because the country needs these people to work, but they have to support their families, dear Lord. So we pray for special protection on them. Dear Lord in heaven, we, we praise your name that in spite of the things that Don has gone through, that he is home, and Vicki is learning how to work with the feeding tube and, and that they have a plan of action now and that they know what to look for. We ask for continued healing from the pancreatitis and, and this uh, blood flow to his stomach. Dear Lord, we just ask that you fix it. Guide and lead those doctors that are taking care of him so that they know how to fix him. So that he can get back to healthy, normal living again. Dear Lord, we pray for Brenda's dad, who's still waiting for test results, that they know what's bothering him, what's causing his illnesses, that the biopsy or that they did, that they have these answers and they can work for it. It's been about two and a half extra weeks longer than they said it was going to be. And we just asked for those answers for the family. Dear Lord, we lift up Rich and Sue Hamstra. We've, we've been lifting them up, dear Lord, but today we just ask for prayers of peace and gifts of love and strength for them as they plan the next steps, the, the steps that happen after the chemo stops working. Give them the strength they need and, and the power and the love they have and the peace to know that you are leading them every step of the way. Lord, we thank you that Chris and her family, her brother and sister-in-law, are doing better with COVID and that they can eventually get back together and, and as husband and wife and not be separated by this, continue to strengthen him as he gets over COVID and, and protect her. She's dealing with dementia, not knowing where her husband is, and, and just bring this family back together. Dear Lord, we pray for this family that had felt pressured to leave Croton because of what the community was saying about them, what the community was saying about their son, dear Lord. And, and families like this all around the country feel this pressure. We just ask for love for them, peace and understanding for the people in the community around them that they may welcome them back in. Dear Lord, we thank you for the blessings in our lives each day. Even though we have this list of prayer requests of things that we struggle with, we, we can celebrate Brenda's birthday tomorrow, and we can celebrate the fact that people are getting better, and there's an answer to prayer, and, and that we know that all life comes from you. And each day is a new gift from you, dear Heavenly Father. We thank you for those prayers. We, we pray for joy, Lisa's a friend who's going through a high-risk pregnancy, dear Lord, and, and they need to protect her and the baby and, and, and follow your will in all things. And, and dear Lord, we just ask that you make your guidance evident to those people that are dealing. Give your guidance and your peace to, to those people who don't know where their help comes from, who don't know that their help comes from the Heavenly Father in the name of the Lord. Dear Lord, thank you for adopting us. Thank you for this time of prayer. Thank you for the fact that you have open ears for our prayers, dear Lord. And we just pray them all in the name of Jesus Christ. And it's his name that we say, amen. <laughs>
chapter story. We're not going to hit all the chapters, but we're going to start here with chapter 37 of the book of Genesis. We're going to read the whole chapter and we'll get a good start on the story of Joseph. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending his flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah, the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age, and he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him, and they could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were out binding sheaves of grain out of the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brothers said to us, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of the dream he had and what he had said. Then he had another dream, and he told his brothers, listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun and the moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Now his, father, his brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, as you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I am going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. So he said to him, go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks and bring word back to me. Then he sent him off to the valley of Hebron. When Joseph arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering around the fields and asked him, what are you looking for? He replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they are grazing their flocks? They have moved on from here, he said. I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But they saw him in the distance, and before he reached him, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come on now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into this cistern here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, this ornate robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into a cistern. The cistern was empty. They had There was no water in it. And they sat down to eat their meal. They looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What would we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites, not lay our hands on him after all. He is our brother, our own flesh and blood. And his brothers agreed. So when the Midianite virgins came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites, who took him to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes and went back to his brother and said, The boy isn't there. Where can I turn now? 
Then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe in the blood. They took the ornate robe back to their father and said, we found this. Examine it to see whether it's your son's robe. He recognized it and he said, it is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and mourned for his son for many days. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, I will continue to mourn until I join my son in the grave. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of the Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. This is the reading of God's word for today. I'm told it's also Siblings Day, so there's some an ironic reading. You know, I've joked about this before, but this time I'm serious when I say that I am the favorite son in my family. I know it, and Sydney and Carrie are just going to have to accept it. <laughs> And just so you don't think I have a baseless claim, I have facts. I'm the youngest. I mean, come on, I'm the baby. You get love anyways, right? I am the only and the firstborn son. And thirdly, I have provided my father, and Rhonda will laugh at this, with his only bloodline grandson. I knew when the boy was born, he sealed the deal for me. And as an added bonus, my mother introduces me to people she knows as my son, the pastor. And we have a little joke. I always make her say I'm a reverend, not a pastor. But now that I've said all of that, and when Cindy and Carrie see this sermon, I know they're going to say the same thing that Joseph's brother said to him. Man, you are true. And... You would think that they would buy me being my favorite with all those facts, but, but you'd be wrong. And, and of course, I'm totally joking. I, I humbly take my place in the spotlight, third in line behind my two sisters and my family. I have no problem sharing it with them. And in fact, we get along quite well, even though there was some sibling rivalry going on growing up. But we get along great now, probably because distance makes the heart grow fonder. I'm sure if they saw me every week, it might be different. In Genesis 37, we read about some serious sibling rivalry, right? This was some bad stuff. Sibling rivalry is, is this jealousy or, or a competition or fighting between siblings. It, it can be healthy. It can be a healthy form of competition, but it can also be destructive the whole time. And of course, we see in Genesis 37 how destructive it can be. Like I said, Joseph's story spans 14 chapters in the book of Genesis. From chapter 37, where we started today, to his death in chapter 50, which is the last chapter of the book of Genesis. Joseph's story goes beyond this sibling rivalry, though, and we'll get to that. But in chapter 37, we catch up with the patriarch Jacob and his 12 sons in a, in a genealogy that comes right after his brother Esau's. And we see that Jacob had two wives and he had a few concubines, but he loved Rachel, his first wife, most. That means he loved Rachel's offspring, Joseph, the most. And his brothers knew it. He, he had this stronger love for his youngest son, the baby of the family. A younger son that he was blessed with later in life. He loved Joseph the most and he shared it by giving him this special colorful coat. A lot of people argue about what color was it? What did it look like? In, in the book of Kings, we, we read that Tamar, King David's daughter, had a special colorful coat that had sleeves so on it. And to be honest, the color of the coat really doesn't matter. And what style of the coat, really that really doesn't matter. But Joseph received a special coat from his father, more special than anybody else. 
Clothing was specifically utilitarian in Joseph's day. It was designed function over form. It was supposed to work first and look good secondly. And it was made probably with bland colors because dyes and colors were, were few and far between and they were expensive. And it was, it was meant to protect the important parts while you're out working, whether you're a shepherd or whether you're a farmer or whether you're picking grain. So to have been given this fancy, expensive, colorful coat that was really meant for going out on the town rather than going out to the field was something to take notice of. But as we see, as we read through the chapter 37, that it wasn't necessarily a good thing. If we look at Jacob, Joseph's father, and we go back through his history, we know that he made his mistakes in life. He started off by stealing Esau's blessing from their blind father, and then he, then he ran away from him, and then he, then he tricked his uncle Laban in, in some tricky sheep herding tactics, and, and then he ran away from him and stole his daughter. And, and then, of course, he had wrestled with God that one night before Esau finally kept up with him. All this backstory about Joseph's father shows us that he didn't know how to make the best choices in life. And it certainly shows with his sons. You know, it may be easy to say that giving Joseph a coat of many colors only caused Joseph's greatest troubles. And his father was the cause of those problems. You know, really, this coat of many colors was a special coat. It was, it was like a uniform that showed everybody around Joseph's higher ranking in the family over his brothers. And of course, that made them angry. That made them mad. He was a young man of 17, and it would seem in our story that he was doing less work in the fields and more dreaming than his brothers. While they were out in the fields working, he, he comes up and says, actually it says in the Bible passage that he gave a bad report about his brothers working in the field. And then he catches up with them, and he, and he says to me, because I just woke up from a great night's sleep. How you guys doing? You guys have been out here since four in the morning. Let me tell you about the dream I had while I was sleeping, and you guys were out here in the field. I, I had this, this great dream, and, and both of Joseph's dreams that he tells his brothers and, and his father are all about his brothers and father Worshipping or bowing down to this seventeen-year-old kid who drunk all the time and snitched him out. The bound sheaves of grain that his brothers gathered bowed down to the one single sheaf of grain that Joseph had gathered. This is significant. This this dream about grain because there's a famine out on the horizon that's yet to come, and and, and we'll get to that. And then another dream, he tells his family, and this one includes his father. He says, the sun and moon, that's mom and dad, and the 11 stars were all bowing down to me. Basically, Joseph is saying, look at everything that's in my universe is going to worship me. Can you imagine that? That's an amazing dream, right, guys? No, all it did was enrage them more. They hated him more. They plotted to kill him then. It even made his father angry. It says in the Bible passage, he was rebuked by his father, but I'm pretty sure there was probably some loud noises going on when he was telling him this. According to the family, it was ridiculous for Joseph to think that, that all of the universe around him that they knew of was going to bow down to this 17-year-old kid. Verse 11 in chapter 37 is important, though, because Jacob knew his dreams, and he remembered how important his dreams were and his visions, like that of Jacob's ladder. He kept it all in mind. He kept it all locked away in the Father's vault. He didn't dismiss it, he says. But the only thing that his brothers had in their heart wasn't this wisdom from Joseph, but it was more hatred and his fancy, fancy coat. Like I said, they wanted to kill him. They said, let's just kill him and throw him in a cistern and 
And then we'll see what happens with him and his dreams and his coat. Not all of them, and this is another significant move, but his brothers Judah and Reuben urged the older brothers to save his life. They said, no, no, let's not kill him. He's still family. Why, why do we want to have blood on our hands? Let's just, let's just throw him down into this well. So they stripped him of his colorful coat and they threw him into this big, it's called a cistern, it's a big well. And they sat down to have lunch, which is awkward. Joseph the dreamer, who was loved more than his brothers, was sold to slave traders who took him to Egypt. Out of his father's, out of the brother's way, they got him out of the way. He's not our problem anymore. But this, of course, broke his father's heart. Jacob was led to believe that the blood-soaked coat, which was covered in goat's blood, was the only thing left of his beloved son. It was so bad, he cries out, he goes, oh man, it is my son's robe. Joseph is, has been devoured and torn apart. Clearly he's dead. He's been surely torn to pieces, he says. And they tried to reassure him. His wives tried to comfort him. And he says, no, I will not be comforted until I am in the grave with my son. The story goes on from there, and I can only imagine that we'll find out about how this only made the brothers' hatred for Joseph more because he wasn't out of their way. And we'll go on and, and we'll go through the, the Joseph story and we'll sit and we'll see how the Jesus connection fits in with the Joseph story. And of course, what that all means to us, which is why we study and read scripture in the first place. Amen? Amen. But today in Genesis 37, we see what love does. We see this this, what love does between two people, between a father and son, and then we also see the effects that the lack of love has. Joseph loved his son. He, he loved him more than his other brothers, it says, and they knew it. They recognized it. They saw it. There was this special love just between him and Joseph, and he showed it by lifting his son up higher in, in rank, so to speak, than anyone else, and he gave him this special robe that was really more of a royal robe that would have been viewed as, as someone super important in that family. <clears throat> but then add to that these dreams and interpretations from a 17-year-old boy who doesn't work in the fields, and, and then we see what the lack of love does. I did some psychology searching. Psychology was not one of my favorite subjects because it was super confusing in college, but I wanted to look up what is the difference between love and psychology and love in and, and the Bible. A lot of people would say that the opposite of love is hate, which was the first thing I went to. But really, without love, there is indifference. There's, there's a lack of care. It doesn't necessarily mean that we hate everybody. But it's important to remember that since God is love, if we don't have love in our, or God in our lives, the existence of love and his godly love doesn't exist. Let me say that again. Since God is love, if we don't have love in our hearts, and that would be the biblical kind of love, that agape love, that, that love we have just because, even though the person pushes on your buttons, you still love them, that kind of love. If we don't have love, then the existence of God in our lives doesn't exist. And we can go further into that. We, we can we talk about, I, I don't know my neighbor very well, three houses down, and, and I guess I could say I don't love them, but I don't hate them. But, but we're going to stay simple for now. We're going to we're just going to talk about God's love for us. And as followers of Jesus Christ, we run the risk of not feeling the love from all the people around us. Whether it's a, a hatred, which happens in other countries, Christians are hated and killed, 
churches are burned down or, or whether there's an indifference, somebody doesn't agree with our opinion on something, we can still feel it. We still know it. It, it, it happens, and sometimes it's louder than ever, the lack of love in our life. But Jesus taught us how to love when we aren't loved back. First of all, in John 13, after Jesus finished washing his disciples' feet, he urged them all to love as he loved them, so that people will know they are followers of Jesus Christ when they meet one. Even when the world hates our love for each other, it still must prevail, even when the world hates us. Secondly, in Mark 12, the, he tells us that loving your neighbor as yourself is the greatest commandment. And it's a struggle to love those who don't love us back, especially when that love is obvious. Sometimes that struggle to love somebody back is painful and it hurts. Like I said in the, earlier, if God prevails in, his li in our lives, we have that strength within us to follow his commands, that greatest commandments, and that means loving those who don't love us back or can't love us back or won't love us back. That means loving people who would rather be our enemy than our friend or our family member. Mm -hmm. And when we follow the will and the commandments of our Heavenly Father, then we have this great love connection to the Trinity. Having love in our lives for enemies and friendlies alike gives us connection to the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let me read Jesus' words from John 14. Jesus says this, starting in verse 15, If you love me, you will keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you before long. The world will not see me anymore. But you will see me because I live, you also will live. And on that day, you will realize that I am in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be beloved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Think about that. Those red words, those important words. Think about that. If we love Jesus, our Heavenly Father will show himself to us. Technically, even Moses didn't get that. God made Moses turn around as he walked past him when Moses asked if he could be revealed to Moses. Jesus says we'll have the Holy Spirit in our hearts and he will be revealed to us as long as we love one another, as long as we keep that love, and as long as we keep fighting to love with the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus promises to anybody that has Jesus in their life as Lord and Savior in their life that the power and the guidance and the strength of the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit helps us to love when we can't. The Holy Spirit helps us to form words in our prayers when our suffering is so harsh we can't even form the words. And sometimes that means when there's no love. The Holy Spirit keeps us faithfully trying to love our neighbors as ourselves so that we follow that great commandment that Jesus said. Thanks be to God for this love we have from our Father. This beautiful love that, that is like a coat of many colors. And it's like a coat of many colors that not just one of us gets, but we all get that coat of many colors of love. And then we can give that coat to our neighbor as a, as a sign of love. And we can share the love of Jesus to everybody around us. Amen. Amen.
Dear Lord in heaven, we thank you that when the world doesn't seem to love us as its own, that the love that you have for us supersedes that by far. And that when we pay attention to that love, we can certainly feel that love in it. And we receive your grace and that love. And, and the things that we struggle through in life, we can, we can make our way through because you love us enough to help us and lead us and guide us, dear Lord. Continue to bless this church with your love. As we go out into the community and, and we live and we act in a world that you've placed us in that, that would sooner probably not have a new church and, and, or give up a Sunday or, or listen to, to, to what somebody has to say in, in, in a book that they say it was just a history book written thousands of years ago. But help us to continue to love those people so that they may see that this love that you gave us the power of Jesus Christ is living and active and strong. Thank you for loving us and we love you. Help us to love each other more. In Jesus' name we say, Amen. <laughs>